Hi, I'm R.L. Parker, dark fantasy and epic fantasy author. Um, I'm here with you today to talk about Scrivener. So, first of all, before I get into the details and show that screen, uh, why Scrivener? Well, for me, it was more about being able to organize the way I write and change the way I approached the writing process. Um, I've tried, of course, like most authors these days to write in things like Microsoft Word or Google Docs. <clears throat> I tried some of the other competitive programs, uh, most of which I do not remember the name of uh, because they just weren't for me. They didn't work for me. Uh, why didn't Google Docs work? Or, or to my, to my point of view, Google Docs and Microsoft Word function mostly the same way. So why didn't that work for me? Well, the largest reason was that I just got lost in what I was writing. And not in a good way. I'm not talking about getting caught up in a story. I'm talking about um, whenever I needed to go and dig up details. Like like in one scene, I name a guy. Um, and then, you know, six, seven, eight, nineteen, twenty 19, 20 scenes later, I need to refer to that guy. I had to scroll back and try and find that guy. And I had to, I'm scrolling back because I couldn't remember his name. And that means I can't search for it. That starts sucking real bad when you're talking about a novel as big as Bathed in the Blood of Ravens. And just for reflection, for those of you that might not have watched my other novel or my other uh, videos, this is a very big book. It's 225,000 words, multiple casts, multiple points of view, different locations all over the world, lots of world building details, lots of, of names that I drop throughout this, this book that are relevant. And... It's a, it's a lot to keep in your head all at once. So trying to write it all in one document, and that was the first novel I was trying to write, it gets real challenging real fast. Not to mention that a Word doc that is 225,000 words long, I don't know if you've ever worked with one that big, but even with a, a relatively decent modern laptop, that tends to lag out and get bad real fast. Um, so, you know, in talking to other authors that were dealing with that, their tendency is to break it up and have one document per chapter. And, you know, that may work for some people. Maybe the whole Word doc approach works for some people. But then you're talking about edits being a pain, uh, flip-flopping between multiple different Word docs, uh, keeping your edits in sync between them, making sure uh, when I renamed Tom to Jim, did I check every single one? Did I hit all the Toms? You know, it, it can... It, even that can be challenging in a hurry if you don't keep on top of your organization and or strike it lucky. Or maybe your novels are small enough that it doesn't matter and it doesn't really impact you. Uh, but for anybody out there writing larger tales um, or especially, you know, series novels where you've got multiple books that have to refer to the same things and use the same names and, you know, make sure your travel times between locations are accurate and, you know, timeline details and everything else... Um, keeping track of it in a nice, concise fashion becomes critical. There's also, whenever I was writing in a larger doc, um, I would subconsciously start getting overwhelmed at the story. Um, and what I mean by that is, because everything was in my face every time I went to write, um, I couldn't isolate my, my brain to focus on an individual scene as easy. Yes, I could do it, but it wasn't as automatic as I wanted it to be. It took, it took a little more gym, mental gymnastics. Um, and to that end, when I was making my first pass at writing um, Bathed in the Blood of Ravens in a Word doc, um, I was averaging maybe 500 words a day, if I was lucky. Um, and I wasn't happy with what I was producing, and ultimately I ended up setting it aside. And uh, this is around 2018. I picked up a copy of Scrivener to give it a try. Um, well, then I ended up getting lost in the process of learning how Scrivener worked and uh, trying to get used to the way it behaved um, and how to organize my book and or books and how to get everything configured the way I liked and exporting the way I liked and everything else. And it, it just, you know, excuse me, I got bogged down in that and then, of course, stopped writing. Uh, work took off and day job took precedence and... I didn't get circled back into it until about, you know, middle of 2020. Um, and that's when I finally uh, started from scratch and wrote Bade in the Blood of Ravens purely in Scrivener. Um, 
but I was benefiting at that time by having it already gone through the learning process of learning the app a couple of years earlier, getting things configured and set up and ready to go at that time. Um, so I was able to just pick it up and spend about a day getting back into the frame of mind of Scrivener and then off to the races. So let's talk uh, for a little bit about why that works for me. Uh, maybe it'll work the same way for you. Uh, what benefits my approach? Um, how do I organize my book in Scrivener? Why is this going to be the only tool I use for the foreseeable future? Um, so let's see if this transition works. Uh, just fair warning, I'm new to cameras, I am new to microphones, I am new to this recording software, so if something doesn't work out or it seems a little clunky, please note that and the fact that I always do these as a one take. This is going to be an unedited video, so bear with me. All right, so hopefully you can see my screen now. I'm going to continue as if you can. Um, and then if you can't, then I'll have to come back in and uh, work on it again and re-record this whole thing. So wish me luck. All right. So Scrivener, clearly it's a writing program. But what makes it different? Ignore the stuff on the left for right now. And let's just focus on this part in the middle of the screen. This is clearly where... I do my writing. Um, you can see at the bottom here, if it shows up on your end, that this is a 2,164 word scene. And that is the critical thing to note here, is that this is just one scene. This is a scene where Lawrence has finished his day of chores and he gets called down by his uh, grandfather and his uncle. They give him his suit of armor as his parting gift because he's going out to join the Kingdom's Warrior School the next day. All that said, this is just that one thing happening, right? And when I open this to do this writing, I can focus on the fact that this is just that one thing happening, right? I don't have to worry about the rest of the novel. I don't have to worry about what else might be going on before or after this scene. I can focus exclusively on this one scene. And if I click on the chapter itself, you can see how my scenes break down, right? I don't always go to this thorough of detail, um, but for Blood of Ravens, it was critical because there were times where I needed to stop writing for a week and come back to it or, or whatever. Um, but you can see my scene titles, which only appear to me, um, they only export if you want them to export, and you've you got to do a little bit of gymnastics to make that happen. But it's not common to export your scene titles. Um, the chapter is Legacy, and inside Legacy is A Gift of Ancestry, Final Lessons from Garen, Last Night at Home, Legacy, and then Life in Ashes. So clearly something terrible is going to happen to Lawrence in this, and if you've read Bathed in the Blood of Ravens, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But the important thing here to, to me, for the way that I think and the way that I write, is that I get the title of each scene, the synopsis of each scene, and some little metadata here, Metadata is data attached to or related to a piece of data. And in this case, I've created custom metadata to let me know when a scene starts, when it finishes, who, where it was, and who was there. That way, when I go and I glance back at this later, I can get the uh, critical details, and then I can move on from there and adapt and flow. Um, so I can look at it in this list view. I can go to this corkboard view and drag things around and reposition things. But the to me, at the end of the day, I don't use the cork board ever at all. What I do use is this custom metadata um, to give me a picture of what's going on. And then when I'm inside an individual scene, I can focus on just writing that scene and getting that scene correct, right? I can, I can make sure that that scene is indeed doing what I want it to do and that it's covering what I want it to cover. Okay, so Let's assume that you've got that handled and you know how to write your book and you know you know how you want to approach it. You write chapter at a time, scene at a time. Maybe you don't break your chapters down into scenes like I do. You know, all of that is fine. All of that is fair. However you want to write it, that's up to you and the readers that you're trying to reach. For me, this is what I like. And I want to break this down, not to tell you that this is the way you have to write, but to show you the level of organization that you can get with Scrivener. And this is the other reason that I like it. Now, part of this comes from me being a longtime software developer and 
the organization systems that are in place here are very similar to programming solutions that I've used in the past, like Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, and, and others, where you see a, a navigation list on the left of folders and files, and then when you click on one, you open it up and you can write in it. All right, other people that aren't software developers will see this as like, oh, this is just like the Windows Explorer or you know my Finder view and, and on my Mac. At the end of the day, though, the point is that, that these things are broken down the way they are so that you can organize. And it also breaks them down so that uh, the application is loading less into memory at a time. right? Um, it's only loading these 2,000 words, not all 225,000 words of my novel. So this doesn't bog down. It doesn't lag out. It doesn't have problems. Even on a, I, I've used this on a very bottom-of-the-barrel laptop and had no issues. Whereas I cannot say the same thing for Word or even Google Docs. Um, let's not even get into talking about bandwidth concerns because not all, not all of us write with an internet connection full time. Um, so anything that's online only, you can just forget about for those people. Um, I'm one of those people. So let's talk about organization. Why is this so good for organization? Well, because it's purely customized to you. Um, let me see if I can zoom in and give you a closer view of the left side of my screen. Ignore everything up there for now. Okay, so using this view, you will see that we've got all of these folders on the left, a destiny of blood and magic, a destiny of worlds and chaos, a destiny of factions and powers, etc., etc., etc. Some of these are works I've written, some are things I'm working on, some are things I've only got planned for the future and may never get to, who knows. But you also got things like characters, places, timelines, which these are older folders. I've moved things around since they were originally created. They're kind of artifacts from my first pass through on Blood of Ravens. Um, but let's expand a few of these and you'll see where this starts to really... If you are, are writing fantasy or horror or whatever, in, all in the same fictional universe, this becomes powerful very fast. Destiny of Blood and Magic is the main series that Bade in the Blood of Ravens is the first book of. And you'll see here it's got this dark folder icon because I've published it. Um, the rest of them are, are this, this medium brown because I have not published them yet. Um, but you can see there's a series name. Inside that is a folder for each novel. Inside each one of those is a folder for each section of the book or chapter, um, including things that don't publish with it, incidental stuff, thing, notes I put on the back matter, things like that. And then inside each chapter is the things that are part of that chapter. So every individual scene, and in my case, I also included a parable, which is kind of a prophetic, th uh, poetic blurb at the beginning of each chapter. So when I go to compile, all these are all the things that I've added that then come through. Um, and you can probably see right away how this breakdown actually allows me to... Oh, it didn't zoom in. I am so sorry. I don't know why it didn't. Um, well, do your best, I guess, to try and see it. Or There we go. All right. I'm sorry, I'm still learning these tools. So you can see by the breakdown of these folders how it allows me to organize. I have multiple series in the same view. I have multiple books in each series. And then inside each book, I have all of the chapters broken down. In addition to that, in each series, I actually have a folder for what will maybe someday become a published airline compendium that breaks down the races and everything else. And in here, I have the different species, the different kinds of elves, different characters, protagonists, antagonists, right? Breakdowns of, of what we know about them at different points in different books, supporting cast, World events, settings, uh, the world events aren't in here because that's part of the book. That's a different section down here that I'm not really utilizing. But like, even if I don't fill these all in, and a lot of these are not filled in, 
they're just template files. But for me, in a lot of cases, just naming the template file is enough. And I can glance at that and that sparks the memories that I need and I can move on. Uh, in other cases, I have, for the sake of future publishing, gone in and added more detail. Like to Lawrence, I believe I've got some pretty good detail in here. So this tool is also allowing me to keep my, my notes organized. Right to collect everything in, a, in a, a fashion that I can easily reference later. So when I was writing, you know, the novel Sissy, for example, right here, any time that I was referencing something that would have been affected by the rest of the world or would affect the rest of the world, I could always jump back over to those notes right here in this same project and go and see what I said about that race or that person or that location in the past or, or in the future, as it were, um, so that I can make sure everything lined up, that uh, there aren't any gaps or loopholes in my story. But more importantly, because I have a large sweeping concept for, for everything that I'm writing, using this tool in this way is allowing me to keep everything organized and concise and accurate to each other because all of my books reference each other in some other way. Um, so when it comes to finally, let me see if I can get this back. When it comes to finally uh, getting everything, uh, let me see if I can get this back down to normal size. Whoa. Give me a second here, I'm sorry. Still learning how to transition these things and get them on screen in the right way. Okay, so now that we're back, um, when I'm, you know, while all this tool work and everything else, all this organization helps me write and stay true to my other works much more easily than, you know, if I was to try and do this all in Word docs or on a Google doc, I'm going to end up alt tabbing through 20, 30, 40, 50 open docs just to keep everything in line. I know that because I started that way before I found this tool. Um, but then everything's all in one place. The, the default compile of an app like Scrivener compiles everything in your project. So Rick, how do you, how do you handle that? Well, you handle that through collections, which you may or may not be able to see clearly on the top left of my screen. Let me zoom in to the top left of my screen now. So as you can see there, I've got these names up top, Dusk, Sissy, All Hail the New Gods, ignore that, it's not written yet, Enveloped by Dark's Embrace, the project I'm currently working on, Bathed in the Blood of Ravens. These contain every scene, front matter, back matter, copyright info, dedication if there was one, all of it, excuse me, ends up in here in this view. And they end up in this view because I add things specifically, but that also means that I can add the scenes I want to keep, not add the ones I don't want to. I can add, if I wanted to put pictures in the middle of the book, I could drag them in here, add them to this in this list, even if they aren't part of the actual Scrivener binder, the binder being everything, on everything in your project. So the Dusk collection is a collection of only what belongs in Dusk. And then when I export, I tell it that I want to export Dusk. Um, let me zoom back out and I'll show you an example of that. Bear with me. Zoom back out now. Ta-da! 
Okay, so now we're looking at the collection of dusk. Ignore what's in the middle because that doesn't matter. That's what I clicked on last. I can click on any of these in the collection and I can work from here. Um, I can add scenes from here, but it gets a little weird because they don't line up the right place in the binder. So if you're going to add a scene, add it in the binder and then tell it to add it to the dusk collection. I'll show you that in a second. But from here, this little button in the top is the compile button. I click on that and when it pops up, I tell it which collection I want to export. So I just have to say Dusk. It remembers my settings. I can click Compile. I'm telling it Compile for Word Doc, or there's all these other possible options. I just always do Word Doc. Uh, but you can export to anything, even HTML, and it'll turn what you're writing into a web page, um, which you can then, if you know HTML, you can go and tweak and customize and get it exactly how you want. But I export to DocX. And then I take it over to Google Docs to share with beta readers and my editor. Or I just start from the DocX to do my formatting for publishing or to take into um, uh, an ebook. Um, because from, from Word, I can export it as a PDF much more easily than I can here. So how do I add things to my collection? Is that hard? Is that easy? What about all of these different file types that you've seen? Um, characters, settings, events, uh, regions, whatever. How, how am I doing that? Well, first of all, the simple simplest part of this whole thing is adding things to a collection. If I click on series notes here, right click, and I can say add to collection and pick which collection I want it in. It's that easy. Now it's in that collection. It may not be in the place I want it in that collection. So how do I make sure it's in the correct order? I can drag it and place it wherever I want. Once it's in position, let it go, boom. I need to put that back. And there we go. So yeah, I can, I can drag things around in the collection to make sure they're in the order I want, which also gives me the freedom to write them in any, any type of organization that I want, because I don't have to worry that my binder is out of order of how I want it printed. Right. I can put my binder in whatever format and ordering that I want to make it easier for me to produce the fictional work, which to me is very freeing. Um, as far as the, the other things, like how do I do the character sheets and stuff like that, those are all templates. Even my scenes are templates. If I go to All Hail the New Gods, for example, and I say, oh, this chapter, all of these are going to be trashed and rewritten, so none of that matters. But I can say add item scene and boom, there's a scene and it'll have the formatting that I like to write in. So if I click into it, Laura regular 11 with the pet, with the, the margin settings that I like. This is how I write. It's not necessarily how I publish. It's a slightly different format for publishing, but this is softer on my eyes. It doesn't distract me from what I'm writing. So this is what I use. You could use whatever font you want and the Scrivener will import any fonts that are on your entire system. So just install whatever fonts you want, open Scrivener and change it. Um, but you do that through these template files. You can dictate that here, right? So this doesn't say anything. There's nothing that looks special about this. It's just a file that I've named scene. I've given a label of scene and I've given a status of first draft. That means every single one that I add to the rest of my books or anywhere else in the binder, when I say add item scene, it comes through with the label of scene and a status blah, blah, blah. Those labels matter when I go to compile because I can set up special settings and configurations for that label and say, if you see a scene file, if you see something that's marked as a scene, export with these options, you know, change the font to this, change the thing to that, whatever I want. So all I have to do then is add a file to this template sheets folder, label it the way I want, give it the name that I want, format it the way I want, and then anytime I add anything of that type, it comes in with that formatting and that name. So if I come into timeline, for example, and I say add event, it creates a new event file. All of this is already here. I can just change this text to say whatever I want um, all right, so I'm back. Um, sorry for the weird clip there in the edit. Uh, I forgot 
that I mistakenly set spacebar as my start and stop recording. So as soon as I type Scrivener space in that last clip, cut me off. And that is the, uh, the growing pains of me starting a channel. So I'll be changing that after this is done to something I would not normally type when I'm giving you guys examples. Um, to resume where I left off. So Scrivener for me is a tool that a, helped me organize and, and keep it straight. Keep everything in my world straight. Uh, let me create those template files that you saw me showing off so that I could focus on uh, getting a different format for each type of data that I wanted to store about my book. All, everything around my book I could keep formatted the way I like. And to me, that helps me organize and keep, I keep saying organize. I guess it's that important to me. I'm sorry for the repetitious uh, thing here. Um, point is, it helped me get everything straight in my head to a point where I didn't have to focus on it anymore. All right. How I set things up is no longer a concern. Let me adjust this camera a little bit. How I set things up isn't a concern anymore, meaning I don't have to go in and create a new project and create folders and all of that every time I want to write. If I want to start a new book, I literally just right click, add label, you know, add folder, label it as a book, right click, add folder, label it as a chapter. I do have to do that when I start a new novel in the same world. But I don't have to worry about setting up everything else. It's already there. If I have a new book that's ready to, to export for publishing, then I already have the settings that I did for Baden the Blood of Ravens and Sissy and Dusk, and I can import those over to the next novel very easily and then just go. Right? So, and anytime I'm writing on a new novel, like right now I'm writing on Enveloped by Dark's Embrace, I didn't show that folder because that would be massive spoilers. But, because I'm writing on that inside the same Scrivener project, everything's co-located. Meaning everything I wrote in Blood Ravens is still there. Everything I wrote in Sissy is still there. Everything I wrote for Dusk is still there. All the notes I've collected through all three novels. Right there, same project. I just expand a folder, click a file, and boom, I know everything I need to know about Lawrence. Right? If I want to know what happened in a specific scene, I click, 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 boom, I'm in that scene. And I can read what happened in that scene. Because I did the custom metadata that I did, because I did the scene synopsises that I did, I can see at a glance what happened where and with whom. So I can always click in. I don't even have to open the scenes most of the time. If I'm referring to something in book two that happened in book one, I can go and glance at that folder overall and see that big breakdown I showed you earlier of the scenes with all that blue and red text to the right. I can see right there. Oh, that thing happened at such and such a place, and yes, Garen was there. Or, no, Kirillis was there, but so-and-so wasn't. Or, whatever I need, all that information is right there at a glance. And I don't have to dig through different Word docs. I don't have to open physical copies of my book and go flipping through pages to find things. I don't have to refer to piles of paper notes next to my laptop. I don't have to have post-it notes anywhere. All of my notes are right here in this project. And this project works offline. Scrivener is an offline program, meaning I don't have to have an internet connection, so I don't even have to store this stuff in a Google Drive and then be like, oh, I'm writing at a coffee house and don't have internet, and I need that note right now, so I have to stop. No, never an issue, ever, because it's all right here in Scrivener, right? So, yes, I do back my project up online. I do that by synchronizing folders with Google Drive, right? There's tutorials for that. I'm not here to teach you that. You can do that with any folder on your on your laptop. And whether you're writing, if you're writing in any offline tool, I would always suggest keeping backups online just in case your laptop dies, you know, or whatever device you're writing on. That way you can always go back to what you wrote before. It's a very smart move. So I have that. And that means anytime I have an internet connection, if I generate an archive file or whatever through Scrivener, it will automatically back up my entire writing folder for me um, the moment I have another internet connection. But I can work without an internet connection. And that was critical to me. Um, I don't have broadband options where I live. They don't exist within a half mile radius of my house because we're out in the middle of nowhere in a rural area surrounded by farmland and forests. Um, 
you know, would I love to have an internet connection at home? Yes. Uh, Elon Musk, come on with that Starlink money. I've been on the waiting list a year and a half, but I don't have it today. So I, I make do with what I've got. But that also means, you know, I, I was the same way with software development. You know, we use apps like Visual Studio Enterprise Edition or VS Code for uh, more modern stuff with things like uh, uh, Salesforce development. Um, and you use those tools much the same that you would Scrivener. So perhaps I'm biased, and I'll admit that I am. Um, but I can say that those tools work well because they're made well, and because they once you get used to the tool, the tool handles so much for you that you can just focus on what you're trying to do, writing code or writing a scene or constructing a chapter. Or, right? you, you can focus on the creative part and less on the logic part because the tool's handling so much of the logic part for you. Um, I alluded earlier to the fact that um, when I was trying to write in Microsoft Word, I, I got so bogged down with the overall story that I couldn't focus as well on the scene itself. I kept finding myself scrolling back to other things I'd written and rereading sections and getting lost in, in the, the whole scope. By rewriting in Scrivener, I was able to take that 500 words per day average and up it to literal thousands. Um, when I was writing Blood of Ravens, there, were, uh, there was a day where I hit almost 16,000 words in a single day. Several days I hit 10 to 12,000 words. My average when I was writing Dusk was about 6,500 words a day, and that includes the fact that I was writing after a full-time day job. I would get done with work at around 4.30 or 5 in the afternoon, have dinner with the family, come back to my office, crack open the lap, my personal laptop at around 6 p.m. I would write until midnight or 1 a.m., so 6 to 7 hours. And during that time, I would get about 6,500 words done on average. So about 1,000 words an hour. And that is provided that I have the story prevalent in my mind to the point that my subconscious is obsessing over the story, which is critical for me to write. I can't write if I'm not obsessing. Once I'm obsessing, I can hit 1,000 to 1,500 words per hour pretty easily. Um, and that includes going back and rewriting portions, rereading it to myself and everything. That isn't just first draft dumping where I, I, I type and move on and don't look back. Um, I do indeed look back. And in fact, that 6,500 words a day with Dusk also included me opening up per writing aid and doing edits and going back to Scrivener shoring everything up, buttoning it up, exporting it to a Word doc, importing that into Google Docs, and sending out new share links to my alpha reader and my editor to say, hey, here's the new version for today. Every day. That's another point I made when the video stopped recording earlier, is um, I use Pro Writing Aid for my self-edits, and you can or can't, it's up to you, but I want to point something out to you, potential Scrivener users or current Scrivener users. Pro Writing Aid Desktop Edition opens your Scrivener project. Let that sink in for a moment. I don't have to copy and paste editing to any other outside source. I don't have to drop it online into Grammarly or any of that other crap. I don't have to export it into a Word doc to get editing done via the Word doc. I can close my Scrivener project because it's a share. It, it's the file can't be opened by more than one app at a time. But I can close my Scrivener project, open my Pro Writing Aid app. It opens my Scrivener project file directly. When I do my edits in Pro Writing Aid, it saves directly to the source files that Scrivener is using. I close Pro Writing Aid, open it up in Scrivener, and I see those edits already done because I just did them to the same files. There's a lot to be said for that. It makes my process very sleek, very fast. I don't have to stress about copying and pasting and moving things between tools. The only time that I'm exporting anything and importing stuff online for other and sharing it to people is when I'm ready for a beta reader, alpha reader, or editor to, to actually dive in and contribute with comments, which they can't do to my Scrivener project, clearly. And then, of course, I, I do have, you know, going back through that and challenges going back through that and syncing up sometimes. But I've gotten used to it. I've fallen into a rhythm. It's, it's easy for me now. So I'm not telling you you have to buy Scrivener. I'm not telling you have to read uh, that you have to write in Scrivener or that you're less of an author if you use another tool. Whatever tool works for you, if you've got a tool that works for you and you're happy with it, then stick with what you've got. Doesn't matter what tool it is, 
Stick with what you've got if it works for you. If you are looking for a new tool, looking for your first tool, or at all on the fence, then I highly recommend grabbing a copy of Scrivener and giving it a shot. Pretty sure you can get a free trial of it. Um, and even if you can't, it's only a $49 one-time payment application. That's the cheapest I've found for paid desktop software for this purpose. And it, it does everything I need and more, and I couldn't be happier with it. Um, I am not sponsored by them yet. I'm open to sponsoring if you're Scrivener developers, literature and latte, literature and latte. Well, if you are literature and latte and you're seeing this and want to reach out to me for sponsors, I am open to that. But I will continue to endorse your app regardless because it's amazing. I couldn't be happier with it. Um, if you are a writer and you're watching this and you have any other specific questions about Scrivener, how I do something, um, how I configure things, if I can figure it out, I will, you know, or if I already know it, I will help you in any way that I can. I'm here to help. This is not a competition. Readers can buy every single one of our books and I'm fine with that. This, you know, there's no gain for me holding you back and preventing you from learning what I know, right? So let's share. This is a, a community of writers, and let's let's keep paying it forward and contributing to each other's success. Um, if anybody is interested, uh, leave a comment if you want to see a video similar to this for Pro Writing Aid. Although, honestly, that tool once you learn Scrivener, the Pro Writing Aid desktop version is so simple that, like. I don't think a, a video is even necessary or warranted. I will say that Pro Writing Aid probably should drop their price a bit for their desktop app. That's the most expensive single piece of software that I own for writing. Um, I, I believe I paid, excuse me, 350 bucks. Um, it is worth it at the end of the day, but I totally would have preferred to pay a lot less. I, I, I don't use it anywhere near as much as Scrivener, and it costs so much more than Scrivener. Um, and... As a software developer, I feel like Scrivener was much, much more difficult to develop than Pro Writing Aid was. Uh, just looking at what it does, so, and maybe, maybe Pro Writing Aid can work on a better hook that just sits and embeds itself within Scrivener, so that you don't have to flip projects. And I can click something, turn it on, and get the writing advice or the editing advice live right there inside the same project. That would be great. But for right now, it's the best tool, in my opinion, for writers that are using Scrivener to write is Pro Writing a Desktop to do your self-editing. Uh, just put that in your back burner. Um, again, I don't earn anything if you go and buy copies of this software. Wish I did, but I don't. Um, all right, that's enough for me today. Um, good luck in your writing progress. If you feel I can help you in any way, feel free to reach out. I am an open book. Um, I... I do not believe in keeping secrets about this whole industry and this process. It doesn't benefit anybody. Um, hope to see you guys again. Happy reading. Happy writing.